on the 6th of December 2001, the fourth episode of Walking with Beasts, Next of Kin, was released. Set 3.2 million years ago in the late Pliocene epoch of Ethiopia, this is a very interesting episode, as it is focused on humanity's own ancestry. The episode starts with some very intriguing narration, explaining how there are some animals intelligent enough to feel emotion. As such, we see a group of apes seemingly grieving over the death of one of their members. The music is very slow and gentle as we pan over the primates before seeing a young animal sitting by his mother's corpse as the title appears. A very sombre note to start out on, and I really like this episode's title. The following scene is just amazing. We are treated to some truly stunning aerial shots of the African Rift Valley, along with some incredible music and narration. The line, this is the cradle of evolution for mankind, gives me chills. The narration also explains how over the last few million years, the world's climate and flora have massively changed the world's biomes. The vast forests of the Eocene are now just a distant memory, as they are now restricted to the tropics, replaced by a habitat dominated by one type of plant we can't imagine our modern world without, grass. Whilst recent research has shown that grass actually evolved during the Cretaceous, it didn't become truly successful and widespread until the Neogene period, which consists of the Miocene Epoch, which sadly hasn't been represented in any of the Walking With series, and the Pliocene. This episode really drives home how the world is becoming much more recognisable to us as humans, going so far as to use live action footage of modern animals such as warthogs and rhinos, which had evolved by this time. These are intermixed with the CGI creatures with mixed success. Yeah, the biggest issue here is that out of all six episodes, this one has the weakest effects of the bunch. This brings us to our main focus for this episode, the primates we saw at the beginning, Australopithecus. This introduction is so cool, as it slowly builds up the mystery as to why these apes are so special, before revealing they are the first apes to walk upright like humans. This is such a cool reveal, or at least it would have been, had they not spoiled it in the preview of the first episode. I've always felt that it would have been so much cooler had they kept it a mystery since the beginning of the series, but if you've watched every episode, as it is, this scene just isn't as effective, which really is such a shame. Sadly, my gripes don't end here. Whilst they are perfect in terms of accuracy, the CGI just doesn't look convincing to me. I think it would have looked better if they had used actors in suits and makeup like in the later series Walking with Cavemen. What's so strange is that they sometimes do use animatronics and what looks to be people in makeup that look much better in my opinion, so I'm quite confused why they didn't just commit to this approach. Oh well. We see the same group of Australopithecus we saw in the opening the leader of which is an older male called Grey. His leadership, however, is dependent on the support of the females, of which the deceased individual we saw at the beginning was the lead. The remaining females, Babel, Black Eye, and Redacted, not being fans of him, especially Babel. We are then introduced to the orphan from the opening, Blue, who has become a bit of an outcast since his mother's passing, as his social skills are not well developed due to his young age. I'm also sure this is the only paleo media featuring characters with the names of Grey and Blue. The narration explains that the group has lost many members to malaria, leading to tension in the group. As such, a younger male, Hercules, challenges Grey's authority, to which Grey T poses to assert his dominance. In actuality, Australopithecus here is speculated to have not been very violent primate and is more of a rock throwing and shouting contest. Eventually, Hercules backs down. Something interesting to note is that this episode is both set and filmed in Ethiopia. As the environment has changed very little since the Pliocene, the narration then explains that Africa provides an ideal habitat for upright apes, as they can move effectively through the trees as well as out in the savannah. We are then introduced to Ancylotherium, a member of the Calicthir family we were introduced to in the last episode. But unlike the animal seen in that episode, Ancylotherium did not walk on its knuckles. It's also nice that these are referred to a specific genus too, 
The model is almost identical to the Calicthir from Land of Giants, aside from the previously mentioned front limbs and the colour scheme. This, however, makes it take a hit in the accuracy department, as the forelimbs are much too long and the neck is too short. I'm guessing they also repurposed the Calicthir head puppet too, or vice versa. I do love the shot of them drinking alongside the Australopithecus though. We are then introduced to Dinotherium, a relative of modern elephants, and I have quite a bit to say about this one. So Dinotherium is part of an early branching group of the Proboscidea, that being the elephant group, that exhibited many unusual characteristics, the most distinctive of which being its downward pointing tusks. Scientists are still unsure of what the function of these tusks were. The most accepted theory seems to be for stripping bark from trees, but there is no evidence of this. Another strange trait are its really long legs, which this model portrays. This, however, leads to another unknown about this animal, the length of the trunk. Here it is portrayed with quite a short trunk. This has led some to question how these animals were able to drink if their trunks were indeed very short. A solution to this issue has been suggested in the form of entering water bodies entirely to drink, which modern elephants are known to do on occasion. Another oddity is its outer appearance. Because it branched off quite early in the Proboscidea, it may not have resembled modern elephants that closely, but this remains unknown. Here it is portrayed with very elephant-like skin, and it doesn't look that good. Something about the texture just doesn't look convincing to me. Finally, the last strange thing about this animal was its size, with the narration stating they were as tall as giraffes. This seems to be a bit exaggerated, as the largest recorded Dinotherium were only 4 meters tall at the shoulders, whereas some giraffes can grow well over 5. These specimens also belong to the larger European species Dinotherium giganteum, whereas this is obviously the African species Dinotherium bozassi, which did not grow as big. Overall, I'm not the biggest fan of the Dinotherium, I'm afraid. A pair of them approach the watering hole, scaring off the Ancylotherium, with their infant giving chase to the Australopithecus, with the narration alluding to them being worth avoiding. Weeks later, we see the group near a beautiful waterfall, as the males continue to squabble, and Blue sits on his own. They are then challenged by a neighbouring group for Grey's territory. Having had their numbers so severely withered, they surrender the territory and retreat. We see them regroup at a stream and quench the thirst. We then get my favourite scene of the episode, a majestic swelling score with a choir, accompanied by stunning aerial shots of Africa. The narration also explains how walking on two legs is an efficient way to move and gives them a higher field of view, especially useful whilst out in the savannah to spot predators. We then get a shot of the apes on Tatooine before they are chased by a male Dinotherium in Muth. Muth. Must. A hormonal state modern male elephants enter during the mating season, where they experience higher levels of testosterone and aggression. I like them using this for the Dinotherium. One of the juveniles becomes separated from the group as they retreat into a tree. Babel calls to her infant and attempts to retrieve them, but the Dinotherium decides to chase after her instead. The infant, however, continues to call for her, prompting the Dinotherium to chase after him, and somehow survives. It's a genuinely tense scene and the music and use of slow-mo are really effective. In the next scene we see the group have found what seems to be an ideal new territory all to themselves. Hercules scares off their Ancylotherium neighbours and one of them does an impression of the General Lee horn from Dukes of Hazard. Later that night the youngsters play but Blue gets left out. The other probably thought he was too good to play with Blue from developing an ego after cheating death. The apes then prepare to sleep in the safety of the trees, with the narration stating that all primates were once nocturnal, hearkening back to the first episode with Godinosha. As a result, their colour vision has vastly improved but now have poor night vision, a trait that has been passed on to their descendants, humans. We then get another tease of a big cat we have been seeing hints of throughout the episode. In the next scene, we see Black Eye has stolen an ostrich egg, another example of modern animal use. The narration explains how walking on two legs allows Australopithecus to carry things whilst moving. Whilst trying to break the egg open, Grey literally yoinks it from her. Rather than chase after him, she just sort of sits there and yells at him from a distance. Whilst distracted, however, she is attacked and killed by a Dinophilus. This is the big cat we have been getting glimpses of throughout the episode. 
It is a Machairodontine cat, aka the saber-toothed group of cats. The model is stunning and basically flawless. It has a beautiful and accurate spotted coat and small saber teeth. The only issue is actually its behaviour. It is shown to be a predator of hominids like Australopithecus, when it is thought Dinophilus was better suited to ambushing large and slow herbivores, and the principal hunter of our ancestors was actually the leopard. The Dinophilus even drags the carcass up a tree like a leopard. Considering how this episode uses footage of modern animals, I feel like a leopard could have appeared somewhere as well. I must admit, I do love how the Dinophilus' legs dangle from the branches like modern big cats do. That night, the group groom each other with the narration describing it as their equivalent of talking, with Blue finally bonding with his group by grooming Grey. A young female joins them, as females move to a new group when they reach sexual maturity. As such, Hercules makes a move on the newcomer behind some very well-placed grass. The narration explains how the change to bipedalism has tilted the pelvis in such a way that Australopithecus now mates facing each other. Grey, however, usually having first go at the females, violently interrupts the pair. The next scene is very interesting, as we see the group using tools to dig up roots and tubers from the ground. Another hint towards them becoming more human. We then cut to a flock of vultures circling over the corpse of a zebra, with a jackal investigating. The birds then ravage the corpse, with one falling over. Hercules, in another showing of tool use, holds a stick that can teleport from one hand to another, apparently, to scare off the vultures. Tension arises when Grey sees Hercules begin to feed, when it is the leader that always feeds first. Using his stick as a weapon, Hercules batters Grey with it, whilst these rhinos just hang out watching them, I guess. With this, Hercules becomes the new leader of the group. As the group feed, the narration explains how future apes will value eating meat as it provides important nutrients and protein for developing larger brains. In the next scene, we see that with Hercules as leader, the group appears more complacent. However, this calm is broken by the return of the Dinophilus. The apes catch its scent and run to the safety of a tree. The Dinophilus bolts after them in slow motion. Blue has become separated from the others, but they miraculously sneak behind the predator and throw stones at it, breaking the lens in the process. The Dinophilus is scared off and Blue sees that the group values him enough to save him when in danger. The closing narration states that whilst they are very human, Australopithecus are not much more intelligent than a chimpanzee, and the apes have a long way to go. The narration says it best when it says, it will be at least another two million years before any ape has a decent conversation. Politicians notwithstanding. I really love this ending. So, in case you couldn't already tell, this is my least favourite episode. It's not bad, far from it. It's more like the least good episode. I think the story is excellent. However, what really drags this episode down are the effects. The Australopithecus just don't look that good, and considering they take up almost all of this episode's screen time, that's a big issue. It's not just them either. The Dinotherium, despite having a really detailed skin texture, just doesn't look well composited into the shots in my opinion, which is a shame because it's beautifully animated. The Ancylotherium were just sort of there. It doesn't add anything of importance to the episode. Considering this episode only has four CGI creatures to work with, the fact one of them is just there as a glorified prop is quite shocking, honestly. It also doesn't help its case, it's just a slight retooling of the Calicathir model, which is not reflective of the actual animal. Luckily, the Dinophilus picks up the slack, but it's barely in the episode. I think a scene where it maybe attacks an Ancylotherium earlier in the episode would have gone a long way for both creatures, as it's an animal Dinophilus would have hunted, and the Ancylotherium could have also fought back. This would in turn also foreshadow how deadly the predator was for when it attacks the Australopithecus at the end. Oh well. I feel Next of Kin was much better on watching than on review, as I feel like I'm quite harsh on it, but I want to emphasise that there's no such thing as a bad episode of Walking with Beasts. It is still great, just not as great as the other episodes in my eyes. With that said, thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned for my review of the fifth episode of Walking with Beasts, Sabretooth, sometime in the future. Bye bye now.